Hi, so in this lecture we're going to discuss an introduction to the to concept of automated visual fields. And through the course of the lecture, this visual field, this example, is going to be what we're going to try to progressively learn about so that by the end, hopefully we understand all the details going on in this visual field. So the first thing I want to establish is why do we check people's visual fields? And here's an example. This is a story of a 50-year-old woman who presented to me in a general ophthalmology clinic complaining that her vision was blurred. But when I went and checked her visual acuity, she saw 6-6 or 20-20 in both eyes. So her vision seemingly was excellent. And everything looked completely normal on the examination when I examined the eyes themselves. So why was she having blurred vision? Because she had a large tumor in her brain that was dramatically affecting her peripheral vision. And the way that we discovered it was by checking her peripheral vision carefully with um, this automated test that we'll discuss more. And so the first point that I want to emphasize is that a patient can have issues such as stroke, glaucoma, brain tumor, retinal detachment, uh, if it's in the periphery, and still have 6-6 six, six vision. And so these patients are easy to miss unless the examiner is being careful to consider uh, peripheral vision as well. So how do we test peripheral vision? Well, in the bedside situation, we can do confrontational testing, which is not the topic of this lecture. Automated testing, which is kind of the most common way of accurately testing someone's vision nowadays. And then there's the golden visual field, which we'll touch on briefly, which is in some ways the gold standard, but it is used um, far less frequently now. So I want to address first the size of a patient's visual field and how it relates to the testing that we're doing. So when we see our example here, we see that it, these numbers, 24 over here and 30 over here, and I'd like to explain what that means. And we first need to consider again what the size of a person's visual field is a normal person. So um, we have this celebrity volunteering for our um, study here. And we'll consider the fact that he is patched on one eye and he's looking straight ahead. And we'll see if he can detect or where the ball needs to be in order for him to detect it. So again, he's looking straight ahead. And we're going to place the ball behind his head and move it off um, in front of him and see at what point he's able to detect it. So it's coming from behind and more or less when it's really just to his side exactly he picks up and notices that the ball is there in his visual field even though he's not looking at it. It's, he's picking it up in his peripheral vision and this would correlate to about a hundred degrees. That means we hopefully are all familiar with, about a 90, with what a 90 degree angle uh, is and he, here you can even see slightly beyond a 90 degree angle, slightly backward even. Um, so that would be 100 degrees. Now if the ball comes from the other side, here it's picked up a little bit later. And here we have about 60 degrees of visual field. So we can't pick it up when it comes directly to our left side from our right eye. And this might be, for example, because our nose, the nasal bridge is blocking our view. When we consider from the superior visual field, again, and we bring it down from above his uh, forehead, he can pick it up at about 60 degrees. A normal person can pick up about 60 degrees, and we kind of see again here that it's probably the um, build of the orbit and the brow here that's blocking the visual field there. And from below, about 75 degrees, when we again consider probably the anatomical build of the zygoma here in the cheek area which uh, obstructs the view um, from seeing completely downward. And so we have kind of an estimate now of what a typical visual field of an eye is like. And look at these values. And now I want to point out that in this, which is probably the most common test that we do, we're only testing 24 degrees each way. And obviously that means that we're not testing the person's complete visual field we're testing really the central part of their visual field, and that's why the test is called a central 24-2. We'll discuss what the two means in a bit, but the central 24 degrees 
So when you're looking straight ahead, it's 24 degrees to your right, 24 degrees to your left, 24 degrees up, 24 degrees down. That's really the um, radius of what's being tested. If we wanted to really test the full visual field, then this brings us to this technique that I alluded to before, the golden perimetry. In this technique here, it requires an actual technician to um, manually administrate the test, and it takes a uh, much longer amount of time than doing the automated perimetry. And it's obviously very technician dependent. But here we can see, for example, that we're getting a person's, this is a normal person's visual field, and we're getting values that's closer to what we predict based upon the diagrams that we showed before. At least in this blue um, ring here. We won't get into what the significance of the other ones is in this um, lecture now. So, again, originally this was the gold standard for many years of testing someone's visual field. But it was very time dependent and technician dependent, and there was an effort to find a more efficient way of testing. And experts seem to pay attention to the fact that most diseases, in order to pick them up, you didn't need to test the whole visual field. And then if you focused on the central area over here within 30 degrees, that your sensitivity was still very, very good to pick up diseases. And so that led to an effort to focus, again, just on testing the central 30 degrees. And that led us to this test here, which is an automated test that tests, again, the central 30 degrees. So if we look here in the diagram, each of these hatch marks refers to 10 degrees. So 10, 20, 30 degrees, 10, 20, 30 degrees, 10, 20, and 30 degrees. And that's why we have the 30 over there, 10, 20, and 30 degrees. It's the central 30 degrees. Even that was found to some still be very difficult for a lot of patients, and an effort was made to see if it could be made more efficient. And that led to a conclusion that for most people, you could even reduce it further to within further by six degrees and just test 24 degrees each way. The only area that was felt that couldn't be sacrificed and that still needed to be 30 degrees was the nasal area. So here, this is a patient's right eye test. This is where they're looking. And this, here we have 10, 20, and we don't reach 30 degrees. We, it's about 24 degrees, as the test says. And this direction here would be towards their ear. This would be visual um, stimuli that are coming from their right side towards their ear, their temporal side. And we see again as we go up 10, 20, 24 degrees, about 10, 20, 24 degrees, because this would be 30 degrees. But here on the nasal side, we have 10, 20, 30 degrees. Here the visual testing is done all the way out to 30 degrees. And that was felt that because um, for glaucoma and a lot of optic neuropathies, that the this six degrees here was still a very high yield area to test and that it shouldn't be sacrificed. And so this is why the visual field that's tested kind of has this abnormal shape here where it's um, elongated on the nasal side here instead of being circular. Now, sometimes we tend to focus even more closely to fixation, and that brings us to a test called the 10-2, which focuses only on the central 10 degrees each way from fixation. And here's an example of a 10-2 visual field. We can see up here the titles central 10-2. And here, these marks do no longer correspond to 10 degrees each. The sum of them corresponds to 10 degrees. And we have this circle here that's testing that area. This would be relevant when we suspect from what the patient's complaining of that their problem is actually very, very close to um, fixation. So I just want to take a step back now and make sure that we understand that the conventional testing that we do, whether it's 30-2 or 24-2 or 10-2, even if all these tests are normal, if the patient says that something's wrong with my peripheral vision, we need to remember that we have not tested their complete peripheral visual field, um, and that until we've done a Goldman visual field and shown, for example, that that's normal, we still need to entertain the possibility that the patient really is experiencing something that we're not detecting.
So what about this dash two that I keep alluding to? Well, the idea here is that when the testing is done, and we'll see this more carefully later, that if we have the horizontal midline and the vertical midline, that testing is always done on either side. It's not done on the midlines themselves. It's done either above or below, or um, to the temporal side or to the nasal side, so that there's always a symmetry that's there. That For every point that you pick, there's a corresponding point on the opposite side, whether it's the opposite side horizontally or the opposite side vertically. This is the idea of dash two or what it means. And almost, I think all testing that we do now is always dash two, 24 dash two, 30 dash two, 10 dash two. Okay, the next thing that I wanna discuss now is the type of stimulus that we use. Okay, I'd now like to proceed to discuss the type of stimulus that we use. And the variables that we can work with are the size of the stimulus, the color of the stimulus, how bright it is, and then whether the static stimulus is a kinetic moving stimulus or a static um, non-moving stimulus. And we'll describe what we mean by this in a moment. Um, we'll start with this idea of the kinetic versus static. So in the examples that I've been giving, where we've been trying to determine the size of the visual field, here the stimulus moves and we identify where it's first seen. And this is an example of a kinetic stimulus. This is the sort of stimulus that's used in Goldman visual field testing. But in the most used tests that we use nowadays, the automated, uh, for example, Humphrey test, it's a static test. And so let's just try to picture what we mean here. So here we have the machine. And the way that the test works is that the patient is going to rest their chin on th the chin rest here and apply their forehead to this um, plastic piece over here. And then they're gonna be asked, one eye will be patched, and with the other eye, they're gonna be asked to fixate, uh, for example, on this um, black spot here which we can't see from this perspective, but has a light in it. That is the light that they're gonna be asked to look at. So let's just picture now that we've placed our head in the bowl and uh, that we're gonna be doing the test ourselves. And there's that light in the center that we're being asked to look at. So what the machine is going to do is it's going to try at each of these points here, each of these 54 locations, to go ahead and determine how well the patient sees in their periphery. So again, the patient's always gonna be focusing here, but various points are gonna be tested. Let's take an example. And um, just to show you that these points cover essentially the 24 degrees each way, except in this case, it's the right eye that's being tested. So on the nasal side, it extends out to 30 degrees. And let's pretend now that we're gonna, the machine's gonna try to establish how well the patient's peripheral vision is at this particular location. So what happens is that the patient has a, um, in their hand a, uh, a joystick or uh, an indicator that they press when they see um, the light. So what happens is that uh, the light appears in that location and the patient sees it and they click that they've indicated that they saw it. And now the machine makes the light, let, light for example, in our, here, a little less bright, and but the patient still sees it and they click. And now the machine, let's say, goes ahead and gives a very, very dim light so that it's there, but it's too dim for the patient to see it. And in this case, the patient doesn't click to show that they've seen it. And then the machine goes ahead and get, makes the light a little bit more intense, and now the patient clicks again to, say, to show that they saw it. And the machine then calculates a value. And this value corresponds to the intensity of the light, the brightness of the light that could be detected at that particular location. And then the machine goes ahead to test all these other locations here and develops a map for us where at each point we have a value showing how well light was seen. In this case, the higher the value, the better the patient was able to see light at that particular location. 
so that this case here, for example, where the value is less than zero, would mean that even the brightest light that the machine could deliver in that location, the patient still was not able to see. And as we said, we're testing 454 discrete locations. And it, this brings us to the idea that there's static stimuli. In each location, the stimulus that we saw doesn't move around. It appears, and it appears for about a fifth of a second, and then disappears. Um, and that's the idea that it's a static stimulus. So this, again, brings us to the differentiation that in conventional testing that we do most of the time nowadays, it's static stimuli versus kinetic stimuli. The unit um, that we use is called the, is the decibel. Um, most of us are familiar with decibels, for example, from, uh, from sound. Um, and uh, this is a relative unit, and we're not going to get into how that unit's calculated. It's not, um, it's beyond the scope of the lecture, but just to, again, understand that uh, the higher the value here, that reflects the better the patient is able to see at that particular location. And for those of you who are already wondering, it's an inverse score. So 32, a uh, high score, does not reflect that the light was much brighter. It's the inverse, that here it was a very dim light and the patient could still see it, getting a high score, whereas here, zero reflects that it was an extremely um, bright light and the patient still couldn't see it. So that again, the decibels are directly proportional to the ability of the eye to see in that location and they're inversely proportional to the light intensity that was presented. So what the machine then goes ahead and does is it takes these values here and creates a map for us showing whether the point is considered normal or abnormal. These points here, for example, this uh, value of 25, I believe, that's over here, is considered normal. It just gets one dot. But these sorts of points here are considered statistically abnormal. and what differentiates them is the confidence that the machine has about how abnormal they are from a p-value that's significant at below 5% to a p-value that's highly um, impressive of below 0.5%. Sometimes uh, students will make the mistake of looking at a map like this and assuming that over here that this means that the patient couldn't see it all because it's black, that it's zero, that's not the case. It's just saying that the machine's highly confident that it was abnormal. For example, here we see that there was a score of 13. The patient does see there. But um, again, the machine is saying that it's extremely confident that well, the vision in that area is highly abnormal. So then we come to something called the grayscale map. And I'm going to just show that over here. And uh, that's this part that we're zooming in on over here. Um, this is a different patient. But um, the grayscale map is kind of a, a, a visually pleasant way of showing the visual field. And um, in some ways, it's easier for someone to look and envision what's going on over here than to look at these discrete points. The problem is that sometimes people who, again, do not understand what's going on well enough um, make the false impression that each of these points have been tested. And that's obviously not the case, that there's a lot of extrapolation that's going on here and assumptions of what's going on between various points. And so sometimes this can be inaccurate in the way that it reflects the visual field because it's trying to fill in the gaps. And this is what many consider the layperson's way of looking at the visual field. It's useful if you're explaining it to a patient. But really, we should look at these maps um, that show the actual locations and make our judgments based on those. And just we'll come to it later, but there's the pattern deviation that I've been showing examples of in the previous slides. And there's the total deviation. And we'll, again, uh, come to discuss what each of those means separately. I now want to talk about a concept called the hill of vision. And what we notice if in this normal patient is that as we go from the periphery towards the center, that we see that the values consistently increase. 
So 27, 29, 31, 32, 33. Or if we go from here, 30, 32, and then it goes up to 33. Um, so that we see this pattern that the scores usually will be lowest in the periphery and they'll progressively increase as we move towards the center. And the highest value will be obviously what the patient looks at when they're foveating, looking directly at something. That's not shown directly in the map, but it's shown on the side as the foveal threshold. And if we just move to an example here in this particular case, here's where it shows what the value of the fovea was, 40. And we expect that to be the highest value. And so as the data is being obtained, if you're a technician, you're looking at the screen and seeing it coming in, you can already make predictions about when something is abnormal, when it breaks this pattern. So, for example, look at this visual field here and ask yourself if it respects the principles of the hill of the vision. And you'll see, for example, these points here that break the rule. So here we go from 25, it should get higher, but it goes to 10. And then it goes back up to 28, so we see an abnormality here. Here again, we see an abnormality it was 25. As we move closer in, it should only get higher, but it doesn't. It drops down to 12, it goes to 18. This is still abnormal. Only here it gets up to 30. So we see abnormalities in this area, and that's kind of reflected in the grayscale here as well. So we've discussed at this point, we can understand that in terms of the stimulus that's presented, that we can be kinetic or static and that we can alter the brightness. And now we're going to talk about how um, the size of the stimulus and the color of the stimulus can also be altered. So if we look over here on the printout that we have, it says that the stimulus is a stimulus 3 and it's a white stimulus. And what that refers to is that uh, again, the stimulus was white, and the background light is also a white, so it's a white-on-white -white stimulus. And for most patients, this is a stimulus of this size. It's not shown to scale here, will be suitable. But if th in this case we here, we see a patient who scored horribly, um, zero at each point. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're absolutely blind. It just might mean that their vision is so bad that they just can't see a stimulus of this size, even at its maximal brightness. And so before we give up on them, we should increase the stimulus size, and we could repeat the test, increasing the stimulus size to 5. Um, the smallest stimulus that can be used um, on the other end of the spectrum is a 1. But for by far and away, the vast, vast majority of tests that are done are using the stimulus 3 as a default. In addition to uh, changing the size of the stimulus, another possibility is to change the color of the stimulus. And this is done under various circumstances where not only the color of the stimulus itself can be changed, but the color of the background can be changed as well. I now want to talk about the uh, concept of a strategy. And we see strategy alluded to in the printout over here, where, for example, the strategy used in this case was acetophast. And there's different names of strategies that you might see on the printout. Full threshold, fast pack, CETA standard, CETA fast, just to name a few. So let's come back to the example that we said and imagine that the test is being done. The patient's asked, being asked to look on this target, at this target. And the machine's going to test how well they see light at this particular location. So one way of doing the test would be that the machine would start with a very difficult stimulus to see, that if they did see, it would be a very high score of 30. And if they don't see, then it would make it a little bit easier to see and progressively make the light easier and easier to see until finally the patient clicks that they saw something and th then the machine could determine that the score was 14 there. Obviously, this would take an extremely long time. Another approach would be to do the opposite for the sake of time to try to go a little bit quicker. And the machine would make jumps by five until the patient finally clicked to say that they saw it. But would it obviously be fair to conclude that the score was 10 over here? So obviously not. Um, and so what could be done in this case? Well, 
the machine could then, once it has an idea of where the range is, of where it sees, to go ahead and do more detailed testing over here. So it clicked t at 10, yes. So then the machine would then go ahead and progressively make the stimulus more difficult to see and see if the patient sees it. So in this case, again, it didn't see anything. The patient, not it, the patient didn't see anything when it was um, a stimulus of 15 was presented. But then the patient did see when the stimulus of 10 was presented. And so now the machine makes it progressively more difficult to see by smaller increments. The patient still clicks yes at 11. The patient still clicks yes at 12, yes at 13, yes at 14. But at 15, the patient doesn't see it. It's too dim. And so from this, the machine goes ahead and concludes that likely the threshold is at 14. And if the thresh, the strategy was very obsessive, it could start reducing it again to see if, in fact, the patient now clicks yes once again when it gets to 14. This idea here is called a bracketing algorithm, where it's trying to go above and below the threshold in order to really lock in accurately of where it exists. Another possibility is that the machine for each of the 54 locations plus the fovea threshold could do this algorithm of progressively, um, by small increments, trying to test at each point, which would be extremely long. Or we can remember the concept of the hill of vision, so that the machine can deduce from one point to the neighbors what likely the range will be. So that, for example, if here the patient's threshold was 31, then we can assume that if they're normal, that the value is going to be a little bit higher when this point here is tested, so that instead of randomly testing this point, we can more selectively uh, check a more narrow range to see if that's correct and obviously greatly improve the efficiency. Or if there's abnormalities, if the machine sees that over here at this point there is an abnormality and here at this point there is an abnormality, then it might deduce that there's a high likelihood that this next point here over here is going to be abnormal instead of pre starting with a very difficult score to see it might make it start off in a more selectively uh, selective range that's easier to see for the patient and this could speed up the efficiency of the test and that's kind of the idea that we can use to think about these different strategies from a maybe a full threshold that's very obsessive and kind of checking each point uh, extremely carefully, and that will be extremely long, to strategies that try to be more efficient, um, that will be a uh, shorter duration for the patients to um, have to undergo, but will still try to be um, accurate in terms of their um, output. And so that leads us into what uh, CETA standard, which is a very popular strategy that's thought to be a good compromise, that it's still accurate, but yet very efficient. Um, CETA, by the way, stands for Swedish Interactive Thresholding Algorithm, and that refers to the uh, group that uh, came up with this particular algorithm. Um, and then after this was used, because this was still, for some patients, a very difficult test to still undergo in terms of the time that was required, uh, they developed a more efficient algorithm, or that was at least better in terms of the time that it w needed to take it, that it was shorter, about two-thirds, called the CETA fast algorithm, uh, with somewhat of a compromise in terms of the accuracy.